Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue talking about the various types of white blood cells. We're going to be discussing basophils, mast cells, and another type called an eosinophil. All right, so basophils and mast cells. Um, these types of cells have pretty much the exact same function. The only difference between basophils and mast cells is where we find them. So remember that basophils are one of the five major types of white blood cells that we find in the blood. And so that's just that. Basophils are in the blood. Now, you don't want basophils just to be in the blood. You'd also like to have something that functions in the same way in the tissues. So over time, what can happen is basophils can actually uh, be stimulated to migrate into particular tissues, and when they do that, they slightly differentiate. Not enough to change their function drastically, but enough to change their name, and once they take up residence in tissues, they're called mast cells. So they're basically the same thing. We can treat them in the same way. Just understand they're in a different location. Basophils are in the blood, B for B, and then mast cells are in the tissues. Now, I kind of hinted at this in the previous video. Basophils and mast cells do not attack other cells directly. So unlike neutrophils and macrophages and things like that that actually perform phagocytosis, uh, these guys do not attack. Okay? They kind of sit on the sidelines and they release chemicals that can damage foreign material and foreign pathogens. So in other words, they create an environment that is conducive to defense by releasing chemicals. And mainly what we're going to do here is just talk about the chemicals that they release. And there's five major kinds, histamine, heparin, prostaglandins, pyrogens, and chemotactic factors. So let's break each of those down individually. Right? The first kind that they release is histamine. Histamine is actually not a class of molecules, it is a molecule. Um, histamine is a molecule that promotes vasodilation and increased vascular permeability. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so histamine is released locally. Okay, so let's suppose you cut yourself on your arm. Okay, so only in that area where you're cut are the mast cells and basophils going to be releasing histamine. So it's going to promote vasodilation just in that area. Well, why would you want the blood vessels to vasodilate? Well, that's what's showing right here. The reason you'd want the blood vessels to vasodilate or increase in diameter is to get more blood to that area. Well, why would you want to get more blood to that area? Because blood carries with it white blood cells. White blood cells that can potentially... Uh, fight the infection, like neutrophils. And I say macrophages here, but there are a few macrophages in the blood, but also monocytes that could then differentiate into macrophages when they enter the tissue area. Okay? Also, there are other factors that are brought with, like complement proteins. Um, these are proteins that are part of the immune system that also help to fight infections. Basically, by dilating the blood vessel, you allow more blood flow and more goodies to get to the infected area to help fight the infection. But here's the problem. Just dilating the blood vessel doesn't do you any good if the things in the blood can't cross into the tissue area, or I should say the interstitial area. Remember that blood vessels, even though they have gaps between them, generally those gaps are not big enough to allow things to move through very quickly. Okay? Yes, white blood cells can squeeze through via diapedesis, but in order to get things through to the interstitial area effectively, you have to do what's called increased vascular permeability. And that's what histamine does. Basically, what histamine does is it increases the size of the gaps between these endothelial cells that line the blood vessel. So notice here, before we have histamine, it looks solid. Okay? Now, there are gaps, but they're pretty small. With histamine, these gaps increase in size, and so all sorts of stuff can sort of move through the gaps and get to the infected area. So that helps white blood cells get through more easily. It helps other proteins, like complement proteins, antibodies, basically get everything to the interstitial area where that tissue is infected or injured. Okay, So histamine, very important. Heparin is also released. Heparin is an anticoagulant. Okay? Um, initially, you don't want coagulation where there's an infection because if the blood was to coagulate, it would block things from getting to the infected area. So heparin is an anticoagulant that prevents the blood from clotting and allows effective movement of things to this area and then through to the injured area. 
Also prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are a type of eicosanoid, type of hormone, and they are going to promote vasodilation in a similar way to histamine, but they also promote pain and fever. So pain is pretty self-explanatory. Fever is also promoted by the substances called pyrogens. So pyrogens are any substance that elicit fever. Now, we tend to think of fever as a very bad thing. It makes us feel cruddy. But actually, fever, where our body elevates its temperature, actually helps fight the infection. A lot of immune substances are more active or have a higher activity when the temperature goes up. The other thing that happens is bacteria have a harder time surviving when the temperature increases. And so overall, our metabolic rate increases. And the whole goal of the fever is to, again, create an environment via an increase in temperature that helps fight the infection. Okay? So actually, believe it or not, if you take a medication that actually reduces your fever, you may actually be prolonging the infection because the purpose of the fever is to fight the infection. Now, you can end up with a fever that's really high and very dangerous, and of course then you want to bring the temperature back down. But as long as it's a moderate fever, it's actually not a good thing to block the fever with a medication. Okay? Even though it tends to make us feel a little better, it can actually prolong the infection. The other thing that basophils and mast cells release are chemotactic factors. These are chemicals that attract other immune cells. So let's say that we've got a mast cell in the tissues, it's releasing chemotactive factors. They kind of go back into the blood and kind of concentrate in this area. Well, if a neutrophil, let's say, is floating through the blood, how does the neutrophil know where the infection is? Well, those chemotactive factors are a signal that say, hey, the infection's right here, stop. And so when the neutrophil encounters the chemotactic factors, it'll say, hey, I need to perform diapedesis. It'll go along the blood vessel wall and it will squeeze through these gaps and get to the infection injured tissue or infected tissue area. So those chemotactic factors are just chemical signals that attract other immune cells. Okay, So that's the, basically the gist of basophils and mast cells. You can see here that all of these chemicals that are released by them don't really attack any other cells. They just create an environment that is conducive to fighting the infection, conducive to immune defenses. The other thing I want to mention about basophils and mast cells is that if we look at them, they have large granules. So like neutrophils, they are granulocytes. Okay? And with basophils, they have very, very dark, dense granules. When we look at these under a microscope slide in a future video, we'll see that the granules are so dense that oftentimes the entire cell will appear blue. Okay? But this is our second type of granulocyte. Mast cells operate the same way. Now our last cell type that we're going to look at in this video is also a granulocyte. And this is what's called an eosinophil. Okay. Eosin is a stain that stains red. Okay. Now it just so happens that when you perform the staining procedure on an eosinophil, um, the cytoplasm turns very, very red. Okay. So if you're looking at an eosinophil under a microscope, you'll know because it's the only one of these white blood cells that actually appears red. The other thing is you'll see granules, and it's actually the granules that are staining red. And so having dense granules, it's going to be another granulocyte. So we've got our three granulocytes, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. The other ones, which include the lymphocyte, not discussed here, and the macrophage are agranulocytes because we don't see dense granules stained in these cells. Now, eosinophils, they are going to directly attack other organisms. Um, and I say organisms because eosinophils generally don't attack single cells. In fact, what they attack are parasites. If you actually do a, a differential white blood cell count, which we will do in a future video, and you actually calculate that there is an increased percentage of eosinophils, that's a good indication that the person might be suffering from a parasitic infection. Now, unlike the basophil and mast cell, which simply release chemicals to create an environment that's conducive to an immune response, eosinophils will directly attack other cells or organisms by releasing cytotoxic chemicals. Okay. So here's an example of one of these organisms. This is actually a helminth, which is a very common uh, type of parasite that you can become infected with. Um, helminths are large multicellular parasites. And in fact, just it's just for the sake of the picture, but 
actually this helminth is way bigger than it's given credit here for. Okay, um, these eosinophils would be tiny compared to this large multicellular parasite. Okay, um, they just did that here for the sake of space, and so you could see everything. But in reality, this helminth or parasite would be far larger than these eosinophils. Okay, so how exactly do eosinophils function? Well, look at the helminth right here. As we've talked about in previous videos, and we'll talk about again much later in more detail, the organism has surface antigens. And remember that antibodies bind to those antigens. Okay? Antibodies complex with antigens. And these antibodies, like this one right here, they mark that organism for destruction. They mark it as a foreign invader that needs to be destroyed. Now, for parasites generally, the type of antibody that binds to the surface antigen is IgE. There are five classes of antibodies. There's A, E, D, and then G and M. Okay? E is the one that specifically binds here. Now, the eosinophil has cell surface receptors, and these receptors can bind to IgE. So if the IgE is bound to the surface antigen and an eosinophil comes along as shown right here, the eosinophil will bind to the IgE. And it will only bind to the IgE if the IgE is complex to the surface antigen. So in this way, the eosinophil knows when there is a foreign invader. And so when this occurs, and the eosinophil binds to the activated IgE, the eosinophil itself becomes activated. Now, as I mentioned before, this parasite's very, very large. It's much larger than these eosinophils. So it would be too large in its current form to be phagocytized even for a very large macrophage, way too big. So these cytotoxic chemicals over time will actually bust up this multicellular organism into individual cells. And then it turns out that these eosinophils can then perform phagocytosis on the leftovers or the remains of the parasite. Okay? So first step is complexing with that IgE. Then it will release the cytotoxic chemicals over time, the organism will break apart, and then the eosinophils can phagocytize what's left. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, and hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of basophils, mast cells, and eosinophils. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.